I'm Donna Gress, and the topic for today will be breast AJCC 8th edition staging. First, we're going to talk about the TNM and prognostic factor categories. It's very important to understand the anatomy in order to do breast staging correctly. For the chest wall, this is specifically described in the AJCC chapter. It includes the ribs, the intercostal muscles, the serratus anterior muscles, but not the pectoral muscle. Now for intramammary nodes, these are often found within the actual breast tissue, but they are considered axillary nodes for staging. Now for the regional nodes, the chapter lists information on both the location and alternate names. Some examples would be level two are many times called interpectoral nodes or Rotter's nodes. Level three can be called infraclavicular nodes. Now supraclavicular, those are only the nodes in that specific triangle that is described in the chapter. Any nodes outside of that triangle are considered lower cervical, which is M1. Now the clinical T category, the size is what's most important for many of the T categories. The most accurate size is needed. Don't just choose the largest. You need to review the physical exam, the mammogram, the ultrasound, and even the biopsy. Many times the biopsy will give you the tumor size. Also look for a physician statement. Now multiple simultaneous ipsilateral tumors. The T category is based on the largest of the multiple tumors and you must use the parentheses M suffix to indicate the additional tumor burden. Now skin dimpling or nipple retraction is not used for staging. So be sure that you don't add those in to your T category. Now, as we talked about earlier, the chest wall structures are ribs, the intercostal and the serratus anterior muscles. For skin involvement, that includes ulceration. Now, if you have satellite nodules, in order to be considered skin involvement, they must be macroscopic and separate from the primary tumor. Edema or polarange not meeting inflammatory criteria is used for skin involvement. Now for inflammatory carcinoma, that includes diffuse erythema and edema, often called polarange. Specific size is not used to diagnose inflammatory carcinoma. There is a statement in the chapter saying approximately a third or more of the breast is involved, but that is a general guidance not to be used as an exact measurement. So please don't be confused by that and looking for that description of a third or more um, and potentially not call something inflammatory if it's a little smaller. Now, this is a clinical diagnosis and microscopic evidence is not required to make this diagnosis. And inflammatory carcinoma it really is a fairly rare disease and it progresses very quickly, often within days, sometimes a few weeks. Now for the pathological T category, when you're looking for the size for the T category, the nearest millimeter is used and tenths of a millimeter should be rounded to assign the T category. Now, one caveat, greater than 1.0 millimeters to 1.4 millimeters should be rounded to two millimeters. Avoid assigning microinvasion, the T1MI category, to a cancer greater than 1.0 millimeters. So it's very important that that T1MI doesn't include these larger tumors. Do not add core biopsies to residual tumor in a resection. You may need to use either the core biopsy or that resection to assign the T category. Many times there are complex shapes that may represent just one tumor. They are macroscopically distinct tumors that are very close together. 
might find microscopic subtle areas of continuity between the foci, and you need contiguous uniform tumor density in the intervening tissues. This does not apply to macroscopic tumor with microscopic satellites. This is determined by pathological and imaging findings, and you need a managing physician and pathologist statements in order to make these decisions. This is not a registrar decision. Multiple simultaneous synchronous ipsilateral tumors, those T categories are based on the size of the largest of the multiple tumors. And again, you must use that parentheses M suffix to indicate the greater tumor burden. Now the clinical N category, clinically fixed or matted denotes nodes that are attached to each other or other structures. This includes extra caps or extension or an inflammatory process. You should consider nodes as movable if there is no statement. Physicians will document exam findings, not what is absent. So don't always think you're going to find a statement calling them movable. Micromets will be designated as such. So you should always consider a node as regular metastasis that is greater than 2.0 millimeters if there's no statement of micromets. <clears throat> it's important to note physical exam and imaging for lymph nodes. Negative exam or imaging should be noted somewhere also clinically detected on imaging or physical exam, such as nodes being fixed or no description, which implies movable nodes, and also the level of nodes involved. The pathological N category. For the PN category, you must have microscopic assessment of at least one node to be able to assign this category. Microscopic assessment would include an FNA or core needle biopsy, sentinel node procedure, or an axillary node dissection. It includes nodes also not microscopically confirmed when you're assigning the PN. No microscopic assessment is PNX. So again, just to clarify, once you have one node with microscopic assessment, you can add in all the other nodes that are not microscopically confirmed. They all do not have to be microscopically confirmed. Now there are three categories for size of nodal involvement. We have isolated tumor cells, that is PN0 I plus, and the size is less than or equal to 0.2 millimeters. Micrometastasis is PN1MI, and that size is greater than 0.2, but less than or equal to 2.0 millimeters. And then, of course, we have our regular metastasis in a lymph node. The size of at least one metastasis must be greater than 2.0 millimeters, but all of them do not need to be that size. And this applies to all of the PN positive subcategories, except for PN1MI. Clinical M and pathological M categories. The M category assessment. This is based on physical exam signs and or symptoms of metastatic disease. Imaging is not required. You would assign CM0 or CM1 based on physical exam or imaging assign PM1 based on an FNA or biopsy of an involved metastatic site, and assign CM0I plus for CTCs, which are circulating tumor cells in the blood, or DTC, disseminated tumor cells, in the bone marrow or non-regional tissue. The M category for postneoadjuvant therapy staging, YC and or YP. This is the same as the M category assigned for clinical stage. If they are M1 before treatment, they are M1 for YC and or YP, even if the metastases are no longer detected. And this is because their survival will not be the same as patients who were never M1. 
So to assign them M0 makes it look like their survival is the same as those who never had mets. Now let's talk about stage classification, the diagnostic workup and treatment. Anatomic stage groups. You may never use anatomic stage group table, even if prognostic factor categories are missing, even if the stage group will be unknown. This will skew stage group data. This is only for global regions where biomarker testing is unavailable. Physicians in the United States must use prognostic tables only, and cancer registries in the United States must use prognostic tables only. No exceptions, and there should be no discussion in the United States of anatomic stage groups. Clinical and pathological staging. For clinical staging, you need the most definitive size from imaging, physician examination, or biopsy. And the biopsy, you can also have biopsies of primary site and potentially biopsies of nodal sites or distant METs. That is all used for your clinical staging. For pathological staging, you use all of the clinical stage information together with operative findings and the pathology report of the resected specimen. Post-therapy staging. Neoadjuvant therapy is eligible based only on NCCN or other national guidelines. If a patient has operable disease, usually the criteria for breast conserving surgery um, is described on NCCN except for the tumor size. That's has very specific criteria um, when they do the neoadjuvant. It's also used for inoperable or locally advanced. So those are the situations when neoadjuvant therapy are normally used. What is not neoadjuvant therapy is a few days to two to four weeks of endocrine therapy, also called hormone therapy. They're due just a few days or a week to test a response of the cells to the endocrine therapy. And you have many clinical trials using imaging assessment, both pre and post two to four weeks of that endocrine therapy. The early response may be a surrogate for long-term endocrine benefit after surgical resection. So if you think about it, when most women are now getting up to 10 years of endocrine therapy after their surgery, in some cases, it's very important to test to see if the patient will respond or not before automatically signing them up for the 10 years of therapy. Now for YC staging, the initial treatment must be neoadjuvant. You have an assessment by exam, imaging, and biopsies, and there is no stage group at this point in time because we don't have enough data. For YP staging, the initial treatment must be neoadjuvant. All information from the Y clinical staging with operative findings and pathology report of the resected specimen. And again, at this time, there is no stage group because we don't have enough data. Now, the criteria for clinical classification, also called pretreatment staging, the patient must undergo a diagnostic workup, which should include an exam of the breast, the skin, and the lymph nodes. There's usually imaging of the breast, including mammogram, ultrasound, or magnetic resonance imaging. They can have a diagnostic FNA, core needle biopsy, or surgical biopsy of the breast. Sometimes they'll have a diagnostic FNA or sentinel biopsy of nodes. And they can also have a diagnostic FNA or biopsy of metastatic sites. Imaging of other sites can be done, and you should look at NCCN or radiology guidelines to understand that part of the diagnostic workup. Now, an incidental finding during excision of a benign tumor 
is usually the start of a diagnostic workup for a malignant tumor. And usually that resection of that benign tumor is not considered treatment for a malignant tumor. Diagnostic versus treatment. A lot of times registrars have trouble understanding the difference and it makes a difference whether it's clinical staging or pathological staging. Diagnostic procedures include sampling of the breast tumor, not intended to remove the entire tumor, and it's not known if the entire tumor is removed at this point. So do not change staging based on subsequent information. Surgical treatment of the primary site includes resection of the breast tumor. Now, margin status does not determine whether or not that is considered a resection. The margin status may necessitate a re-excision. And the numbers show that approximately 20% of lumpectomies have to undergo a re-excision. Now, if a nodal dissection is not done, the resection of the breast tissue is still considered treatment. So the nodal dissection does not decide whether or not this is surgical treatment. Treatment satisfying the stage classification. For pathological staging, you have to have an excision of the tumor. The intent is treatment, not sampling. Usually there is no macroscopic tumor left behind. And sometimes there's a re-excision for margin involvement. And in those cases, both surgeries um, are considered treatment. Now a nodal dissection is not required to qualify this for pathological staging. Postneoadjuvant therapy staging must meet the standard guidelines such as NCCN or ASCO, usually four to six cycles of chemo, sometimes more. Usually four to six months of endocrine therapy, maybe up to one year of endocrine therapy. And again, a short course of endocrine therapy does not qualify. It is given for reasons other than treatment. Now remember, these are the rules for AJCC staging not for registry treatment data items. Information and questions on AJCC staging. The timing and everything graphic is available on the AJCC website for a free download. It shows you the time frame in the arrows and the criteria in the square boxes and helps to give a diagram of clinical, pathological, and post-therapy staging and what is included. The AJCC website can be found at cancerstaging.org. The website includes general information, an overview, version 9, cancer staging systems, which also includes the AJCC 8th edition chapter 1, principles of cancer staging, which can be downloaded for free many different sources for cancer staging education, many different pages and information, and frequently asked questions and resources. Cancer Forum is a great tool for you to use. It's important to search the questions that are already there to see if your question's already been asked and answered. That's why when someone posts a question, it really is information for everyone and can help a lot of people. It also allows us to track for educational purpose to see where we need to do education. This has been developed through generous support from the American Cancer Society and we thank them for that. And I'm Donna Gress, and thank you for your attendance.